give you the first song tonight will be number 542. 542. Were they afraid?
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the opportunity now to pause and to bow before your throne. We're thankful for this Lord's Day and what it means to us. We're thankful for the opportunity we had this morning to remember and memorialize the death of our Savior, and we're so thankful for his willingness to come and for your willingness to provide a plan for our redemption. Thankful, dear God, again for the opportunity we have this evening to join together, to commune together in singing with one another songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. We're thankful for Martin as he leads us and for these songs that we have the opportunity to sing. Thankful for another opportunity to open your word together and thankful for Sidney as he leads us in this study this evening. As we begin a new quarter of study in our Bible program, dear God, we pray for your blessings upon it. We're so thankful for all of those who are involved in leading and teaching in our Bible school program. We pray, dear God, that we would take this awesome responsibility and task and do a good job with it. We pray that we would always be prepared and represent your word and its purest form and teach it to our children and to each other. We're thankful for this opportunity and we pray that our new quarter of study would be profitable and that we would all learn much in our time of study. We pray, dear God, that we would ever strive to love you more as we have just sung. We're so thankful for your sacrifice, sending your son to die on our behalf and we pray, Lord, that we would never take that blessing for granted and that we would always be grateful and live our lives in a way that we would strive to be worthy, though we know we can never repay that debt. Thank you, dear God, for this time together. Bless us and keep us through our worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Four hundred fifty six. <clears throat> Four, five, six. No tears in heaven, no sorrows given, all will be glory in that land. There will be no sadness, all will be gladness when we shall join that happy band. No tears.
We're going to mark number 256. We're saying this as the invitation hymn after the lesson this evening. Two, five, six. Now, if you stand and turn number 72, <clears throat> 72. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I onward bound, Lord plant my feet on higher ground, Lord lift me up and let me stand, by faith on in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18 will be a starting point for us in our study together this evening. It is good to see each of you here. Those who are visiting with us, we are extremely grateful that you've chosen to be a part of, of this assembly this evening. This morning, prior to <clears throat> the beginning of our service, Martin said, uh, I'm leading singing tonight. Any particular song you want me to sing? And I said, well, I'm going to preach on higher ground. So we just sang higher ground. I said, does that, does that bring a th song to your mind anywhere along the way? And so <clears throat> that's what we're going to talk about a little bit tonight. Of course, as we sing that song and we think about the words of that song, the idea is that we are, as children of God, to live above the world. That is, we live above the ways of the world. <clears throat> that's not to suggest for a moment that in some senses we are better than anybody else. Nor should we, as we would say, look down our nose at, at anybody else. But the life that we live as children of God is a life that is distinct. It is a life that is separated from the ways of the world. Two passages of Scripture that I want to use in the very outset, and one of them is in uh, Matthew chapter 18, and a very familiar section to us, but <clears throat> in verses 1, 2, and 3. Of that chapter, the same day came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, <clears throat> except you be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. 
In this section, there is the question, who is the greatest? And if we were to answer that, according to the ways of the world, we would get a variety of answers, wouldn't we? What does it really mean to be great? Well, in the eyes of the world, that's one answer, or a multitude of answers. But in the eyes of God, it is one simple answer. That is to be a servant. And yet, when we talk about higher ground, when we talk about living above the ways of the world, again, we are not suggesting better than everybody else in the sense that that we usually use that terminology. But the idea of setting ourselves apart from the ways of the world in service to God. A second passage that I want to mention in this regard is Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse uh, 34, in which Jesus says, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Who is more dear to us on a physical earthly plane than family? And yet Jesus uses that very concept to suggest the supreme love that we are to have for him above everybody else on the face of this earth. There should be no one that we love to any greater degree than we love our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's where the real difference is in the higher ground and what we might consider the lower ground in that regard. The way of the child of God is above the ways of the world. That's why we sing and that's why we pray, Lord, plant our feet on higher ground above the ways of the world. That's important if we're going to follow the ways of God. You may recall during the prophecies of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9, a very familiar setting or section of Scripture to us. Whenever God explained through the prophet Isaiah, my thoughts are not your ways, your ways are not my ways, saith the Lord. And he makes a comparison As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways than your ways, saith the Lord. And so it would stand to reason that if the Lord's ways and the Lord's thoughts are higher than the ways and the thoughts of men, if we're going to be God-like, and that's really the definition of the word godliness, if we're going to be God-like, then we're going to be carried to a higher plane in our way of life than we would otherwise. The Lord makes that clear in Ephesians chapter 1, in verses 22 and 23. We alluded to this this morning with regard to the church that God gave Christ to be head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him that filleth all in all. When we think about the church, We think about who we are when we ask the question, what is the church? Well, it's people, it's us. It's those who have been baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Who are we? What are we in relationship to Christ? We, of course, are subject to Him. He is the head of the body. He's the head of the church. But at the same time, if we're going to follow the head, then it's going to put us on a higher plane. It's going to give us a different walk than it's going to give those of the world. So when we think about this concept, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground, what we're really suggesting is that there are changes that are required. There are changes that are necessary over a worldly life in order to live the Christian life. The two just simply do not run parallel. 
They run in conflict to each other. The ways of the world, the ways of the life of a child of God. In Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, near the early beginning of the Lord's church, you'll recall, let's back up to Acts chapter 2 for just a minute, and you'll recall Peter's preaching on Pentecost when those people had heard and been convinced, obviously, that they were guilty of the death of our Lord, they raised a question when they were pricked in the heart. They said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent. What does that suggest? Repentance is a change of mind that results in a change of action. That's where they had to begin. Now he went ahead and told them to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And with many other words, skipping down a couple of verses, and with many other words did he testify and exhort them saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. What's he saying? There is of necessity a change of mind that's going to result in a change of action. Now drop down to chapter 3 and in verse 19. Peter again, the speaker, says, Repent ye therefore and be converted. What's he saying? There is a way of life that you're living that's going to have to be changed. There has to be that change of mind that results in a change of action. Walking on higher ground necessitates a change of life from the ways of the world to the ways of the godly. Go back with me to Isaiah now just a moment to chapter 2. Isaiah in chapter 2 is prophesying concerning the establishment of the kingdom of the church. The time doesn't permit us to discuss this in detail, but if we were to take the time, we could prove easily that the kingdom and the church are one and the same thing in spite of the fact that so many people believe that they are different. But Isaiah is prophesying here concerning Jerusalem and, and Judah, verse 1, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Then coming down to verse 5, O house of Jacob, come ye, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. There's a specific walk that is demanded of those who are partakers in the kingdom that Isaiah prophesies is to be established. But notice in the reading of this, He's talking about the mountain of the Lord's house. What is that? Well, in Paul's writing to the young evangelist Timothy, he said, But if I tarry long, that thou mightest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. So Paul says in that regard that the house of God and the church of the living God are one and the same. That's exactly what Isaiah is prophesying in this regard. Now notice what he says about it. He refers to it as the mountain of the Lord's house. What does that suggest? It suggests a higher plane. It suggests a higher peak than that of the valleys. And then he talks about this Lord's house being established in the top of the mountains, not down in the valleys. It shall be exalted above the hills. He's talking about the kingdom. He's talking about the church. And again, if we raise the question, what is the church? Or more accurately, <clears throat> who is the church? It's people. It's, it's those who are children of God. And so if the Lord's house is going to be exalted above the hills, what does that say? It simply says to us that we are to be walking on higher ground. That we're not to be down in the, in the valleys of sin, but up on the mountain peaks of righteousness and godliness in our daily lives. So the description of the coming kingdom here is that it is a, an exalted position 
That simply says that those who are members of it are in an exalted position. You remember Peter's writing when he said in 1 Peter chapter 2, with regard to those who are children of God, that they are a royal nation. He refers to them as a holy nation. That is, they are a special and exalted people, a people who are walking on higher ground, if you please. That necessitates some changes in our lives away from the ways of the world. It involves change in mind. It involves change in heart. It involves change in life. Let's look at a few passages that would suggest that very point. In Paul's writing to the church at Rome, in Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, Paul there was encouraging those brethren in Rome to be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, perfect will of God. What does he say? Rather than being conformed to the ways of the world, be transformed, and it begins in the mind, with the renewing of the mind we are then able to transform our lives into lives of godliness, into lives that are going to meet with God's approval, if you please. Sometimes we we talk about that word blessed, and we, in a simple way, define it as as happy. And it is a happiness, but to a far greater degree than I think what we sometimes think about. The word blessed means a state of happiness, knowing that we are God-approved. How do we know we're God approved? When we follow the will of God, we have God's approval. And so when when we have this concept here in Romans chapter 12, that we're not conformed to the ways of the world, but our lives are transformed, they're changed, beginning with a renewed mind that's going to result in a changed life. That's what Paul, that's how he, he speaks to these people. And so So kind of underscore, at least in your mind, that word transformed. There's a big difference in transform and conform. Far too many people, far too many people who desire to be on that higher ground, those who desire to be members of the body of Christ, are still wanting to conform some of their ways to the ways of the world. And it won't work. God will not allow that. It will not meet with God's approval. The only life that's going to meet with God's approval is a transformed life. Change is necessary in that regard. Then again, a familiar passage in John chapter 3. This, of course, the occasion where Jesus was having his conversation with with Nicodemus who had had come to Jesus. And he said, Rabbi, verse 2, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of the water and the Spirit, He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. What is Jesus saying, in essence, to Nicodemus? There has to be a change of life. There has to be an altering of a man's life if he wants to be a part of the kingdom. He's got to be born anew. He's got to be born again. He's not living according to the ways of the world. But again, in the Colossian letter, in chapter 1, In verses 12 and 13, Paul, as he writes this letter, is dealing with the very same concept. Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. What's happened? Here's a life that's transformed. 
Here's a life that has been changed. As a matter of fact, if you go on over to chapter 2 and verse 12 of this letter, Paul addresses that when he says to these brethren, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him, that is Christ, from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together, having forgiven you all trespasses. What's happened? Here's a transformed life. Here's someone who was living in darkness. And now Paul says of them that God has translated you into the kingdom of his dear son. Incidentally, just a, a side note here. When people want to talk about the fact that the kingdom is yet in the future, that Jesus is coming back to this earth and, and establish a kingdom in, in Judah and uh, reign on David's throne for a thousand years, just please give us a simple explanation of how God had translated these Colossian brethren into something that does not yet exist. It's an interesting question to ask. These folks are in the kingdom. Paul, by inspiration, said they were in the kingdom. And who are we to question that concept? The kingdom exists. It is present. And those who are children of God are members of that kingdom. So, so they've been translated. They've been taken by God through their obedience to the gospel out from under the influence of the power of darkness. Now they've been translated into the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of his dear son. Then you think about Romans 1.16 in which Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, for therein, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith unto faith, and as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now look at what he says. The gospel is God's power to save. Well, I have a copy of it. Does that mean I'm saved? That's not what he's talking about. If you go on over and read in chapter 10 of that same letter, he further explains. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Now without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 24, He that believeth not that I am he, he should, that man's going to die in his sins. So just because I possess a copy of the Word of God doesn't mean that I enjoy salvation. But through a reading and study and obedience of this gospel, then there's where the power is. The Word is God's power to save. Through our obedience to the gospel, our lives are transformed from, from lives given to darkness to, to lives that are given to light, walking on higher ground than the ways of the world. You'll notice further. In that same regard, Romans 1, he says in verse 17, for therein, that is in the gospel, verse 16, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. Now, not God's righteousness, but the righteousness that God desires in our own lives. Right doing, if you please. Where is it revealed? revealed in the gospel so when I read and study and understand the gospel and I live my life in harmony with it what am I doing I'm walking in righteousness the psalmist said thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee Psalm 119 later on in that same psalm he said thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path the gospel tells us what it means to live that godly, faithful Christian life. So, so the whole nature must be changed, transformed, heart, mind, life has to be changed. But in that same regard, and thinking about the Word in that, in that regard, think about Hebrews chapter 4. Down about verse 12, the Hebrews writer talked about the Word of God, the Gospel again. When he talks about the Word of God being quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, 
piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit of joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thought and intents of the heart. The power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it has the power to prick the hearts of men. What happened on Pentecost? Now when they were pricked in the heart. They raised a question, men and brethren, what shall we do? That's why people today need the gospel of Christ. It has that pricking, that cutting power to change the hearts and change the lives of people. In John 20, verses 30 and 31, as John comes near the end of the account of the gospel that bears his name, he simply says many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. What's he saying? John has recorded for us incident after incident, miracle after miracle, proof after proof that Jesus Christ is in fact the Son of God. That being the case, we ought to have respect under the authority of Christ and then submit our lives to that authority that we can live pleasing unto Him. In Acts chapter 20, Paul, as he met with the Ephesian elders, he met with them at Miletus, he talked about how that, that his time with them had been spent to profitably. He said, I've kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. I've taught you publicly. I've, I've taught house to house. Then he comes down to about verse 28 and he says to those elders, take heed unto yourselves. And all the flock of which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Then he talks about after his departure he knows that, that things are not always going to go well. I know that after my departing shall grievous wolves in and among you, not sparing the flock. Even of your own selves shall men arise, teaching perverse things, drawing away disciples after them. But then listen to what he says. Now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give an inheritance among them that are sanctified. The power of the word of God to ultimately give us that inheritance. What's going to bring about that change? Well, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and in verse 10, Paul simply says that godly sorrow worketh repentance. When are we going to have that, that, that change of mind that results in a change of action? When we have a sorrow for a life of sin. As long as we're enjoying sin, as, we want, as long as we want to continue in that life of sin, as long as we're not really sorry for sin that's in our lives, we're never going to make any changes. But upon the basis of our faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and the Savior of the world, and that through Him we can have the forgiveness of our sins, it ought to prick us in the heart. It ought to change our mind. It ought to change our thinking about sin. And that's going to bring about that, that concept of repentance, that, that change of mind that, that means a sorrow for living like the world, walking, if you please, in the ways of the world rather than pressing on to that higher ground. There's got to be a change of life, change of mind that results in a change of life. That simply means that we can't do some of the things that we've done all of our lives. That means that we can't talk the way we have talked before in our lives. That's probably going to mean that we can't visit some of the places that we have visited before during our life of sin. It may mean that we have to change some friendships involved along the way. That those with whom we associate or who are not going to, to help us go down that path of righteousness, we may need to separate ourselves from those folks. So that change of life, changed life. Now look in Colossians chapter 3 for a minute, and you'll see that change of life spelled out so vividly, Colossians chapter 3. If ye then be risen with Christ, obviously that is a reference to one who has been baptized into Christ, buried in that watery grave. They've been raised out of that watery grave to walk in newness of life, Romans 6, 3, and 4. 
If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. What is that? That's higher ground. That's higher ground. Seek things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. There's your higher ground. You see, when we are raised with our Lord in baptism, it is going to affect our viewpoint. We are going to look at things differently than we ever have before. So that's going to change the way we live our lives in that regard. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye appear also with him in glory. Now verses 5 through 9, we're not going to read all of it. But in verses 5 through 9, he begins by saying mortify. Now, that word just simply means put to death. Put away from you. Get it out of your life. There's the change that's going to take place. There's some things that are part of some folks' lives in which they cannot continue if they have been raised with Christ. Can't have it both ways. So he lists a, a lot of things in that regard. Then you come down to verse 10, and he says, and have put on the new man. See, there's a change. We put off the old man with all of those sinful ways, and, and now we put on the new man in that regard, which is renewed in knowledge. Did you notice that? After the image of him that created him. To whom are we looking tonight? I recall in the writing of the Hebrew letter, we have this concept, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the majesty on high, looking unto Jesus. So we have our minds renewed in a knowledge of him. Then you'll notice as well in Romans chapter 6, and I know this is a very familiar chapter to us, but I want you to notice something specific in, in this regard. In Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, Paul writes, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Incidentally, as you read through Romans chapter 6, notice underscore, circle, highlight some way every time you see some form of the word dead. And you'll get a good concept of what Romans 6 is all about. So now he says we are dead to sin. Death is nothing but separation. Now we're living a life that is separated from sin, and, and in so doing, we can't continue to live in sin. Know you not that so many of us, as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death? Now get his drift here. Are we going to continue in sin? No, we're not going to continue in sin. Why? Because we're dead to sin. How did that happen? Don't you know that you were baptized into Christ? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. There's where the new life begins, when we're baptized into Christ. And so through that process, we now have a new creature. We are, we are new. We have a new life now. We're children of God. So we're not going to continue to, to live in sin because we've, separated ourselves from sin. We're now dead to sin. Now in that regard, come on down to verse 16 of that chapter. Know you not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Now, here is thanksgiving that we're giving to God because whereas, and some of the translations are a little bit better here in that phrase, we're not thanking God that we were the servants of sin. We're thanking God that whereas we were the servants of sin, we have obeyed from the heart. There's the point of thanksgiving. We've obeyed that form of doctrine. What form? Well, go back to verses 3 and 4. 
We've become dead to sin. We've been buried. We've been raised to walk in newness of life. Christ died. He was buried. He was raised. There's the form that we follow. When we follow that form, we die to sin, we bury that old man. That which comes forth as a new creature in Christ, that's when the new life begins. We ought to thank God for that. Now look at verse 18. Being then made free from sin. No one is made free from sin at the point of faith. I don't care how strong their faith is. No one is made free from sin at the point of faith. No one is made free from sin at the point of repentance. No one is made free from sin at the point of the confession of one's faith in Christ. We are made free from sin when we have obeyed from the heart that form, that death, burial, and resurrection from the dead. That is that spiritual resurrection. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. You see, that's when we began that walk on higher ground we've given up that life of sin we've put to death that old man of sin we've buried that old man of sin and that which comes forth is a new creature in Christ so when you think about that song I'm pressing on the upward way new heights I'm gaining every day then we pray to God Lord lift me up Plant my feet on higher ground. What are we talking about? Lord, help me to live a more godly life day in and day out. Above the ways in the world of sin. Help me live above that. Help me live. Help me walk on higher ground. So when we think about the song and we think about the concept and Incidentally, for whatever it's worth, that's the introduction to the lesson. I'll have to finish it up next week, I guess. But that's the idea behind that song. Where are you walking tonight? Have you been buried with your Lord in baptism? Having turned away from a life of sin, change of mind toward a life of sin, it's going to bring about a change of action in your life. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you are willing to make that change in your life? Confess that faith in Christ. You can be buried. You can bury that old man of sin. That which comes forth out of that watery grave. Being then made free from sin, you're now a servant of righteousness. If you haven't done that tonight, we'd beg you to think about it. As one who has been raised out of that watery grave to higher ground, you've kind of wandered back down in the valley of sin. As a child of God, you don't have to be baptized again. But Acts 8 and verse 22 would suggest that we repent and pray relative to the thoughts of our hearts. John would write in 1 John 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. That might be your need tonight. If you tonight are not walking on higher ground, walking above the ways of the world, you can change that, but the choice is yours. Now, we didn't point it out when we read it a moment ago. Romans 6, verse 16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey. You make that choice. You make that choice. Tonight, if you need to change the choices that you've made and you need to begin walking on higher ground or get back to that higher ground, and we can help you, why don't you let it be known as we stand together and sing the song of invitation.
special announcement. You are invited to help celebrate Chris Stevenson's 50th birthday on Saturday, September 10th at 7 p.m. at the house next door. Please join us for Chris' favorite desserts and coffee. He wouldn't announce that. We can take care of those matters. Um, also, I wanted to mention, too, the, um, the bags out in the foyer for the children's home goods. That truck is supposed to be here, I believe it's next Monday, so we've just got a week. And, and we have had, in previous times, we've had uh, quite a bit more goods collected than we have right now. So let me encourage you, if you've not done that yet, please get one of those bags and, and fill it up with the goods. There's a little uh, list of things attached to each bag so we can make sure we've got a good collection of, of all of the items involved. So if you haven't done that yet, then you've got this week, basically, to, to get that done. So we encourage you to take care of that. Those, uh, those children at that home, they depend on folks like us. Those running the home depend on folks like us. So let's, let's do everything that we can to help them out in that regard. Also, met with the Brothers Keeper group leaders tonight, kind of refreshed our memories as to what the Brothers Keeper program is all about. Uh, some of you have already received a list from those leaders tonight, letting you know if you didn't already know what, what group you're on. I think one of the meetings has already been announced. And so we're getting started with a new six months uh, Brothers Keeper program, and hopefully there'll be some good things happening. Uh, that you will be uh, asked and encouraged to participate in to make our program as, as effective as it possibly can be. So, so please keep that in mind and, and help these leaders out. We appreciate so much those who, who volunteered to, to lead the program for the next six months. Thank you, Chris. You're right, I wouldn't announce that. But I'm glad you did, and I'm looking forward to visiting with all those who have that occasion to come. I'm also glad to know that Sue has some semblance of a kitchen now that she can get me a coconut cake there. So I'm looking forward to that. All right. Remind you of those on our prayer list. Sister Bill, you at least uh, this morning was still in the hospital in Carrollton. I would assume that's still the case. The last report we had this morning was she was in room 436 at Tanner in Carrollton. Uh, she has pneumonia and an assortment of other health problems. Barbara Cron also is continuing to be homebound. She's got a couple of doctor's appointments coming up this week. She's really depressed. If you have an occasion to talk with her and visit with her and uh, send her cards and so forth, she would really appreciate that. The niece of Frank and Lola Head has been moved to Rome. She's still in intensive care, not doing well, but our prayers requested on her behalf. And also, as we would announced uh, last Wednesday and this morning, Corey Wilson join the Air Force, and he's already gone to uh, his basic training, so our prayers are with him. Ken Glover also was not able to be with us today. Again, we extend our sympathy to the um, aunt, or the family of Cheryl Edwards' aunt, Carol Lyle, who passed away. The visitation is tonight from 6 to 9, also tomorrow from 6 to 9. The funeral is Tuesday at 11 a.m., all at Hutchison's Funeral Home in Buchanan. Are there others that we should add? You're invited to stay for our potluck after this evening service. We're kicking off our uh, fall quarter, which began today. The potluck is immediately after the evening service, even if you're visiting with us and you didn't know about it, well, you're certainly welcome to stay. We'll have plenty of groceries for you. The new converts class, for those that are new converts, for those who would like a refresher course in the elementary oracles of God and principles of the New Testament church, you're uh, invited for the uh, class thereof that will be on Wednesday nights for this quarter. The first installment will be this coming Wednesday night September the 7th, and it will be in um, the uh, new classroom area downstairs. I will be the teacher. Golden Age Banquet planning meeting is next Sunday uh, afternoon at 4.30. That's September the 11th, next Sunday afternoon, 4.30, planning meeting for the Golden Age Banquet. Also uh, next Sunday, September the 11th at 5 p.m., 
There's a training class for those who wish to help in the computer and the PA system. Brian will be uh, hosting a training class for those. We need to kind of revamp that and get some more folks that are interested in helping instead of using the same young men over and over. And anybody who would like to help in that effort, please be there for that next Sunday at 5 p.m. Brothers Keepers Groups, the new one, the uh, Edwards Group will meet, uh, this Brothers Keepers Group 2 is September the 18th, which is two weeks from today in the Fellowship Hall. After the evening service, Brothers Keepers Group 4, that's Gary and Jamie Williams Group, will meet at their home Saturday the 24th at 6 p.m. Bring drinks and desserts. We'll have that announced further. There's a men's meeting upcoming Sunday, September the 25th at 5 p.m. That's the last Sunday of this month. Also, excuse me, also after um, that at 7 p.m., we're looking forward to having Brother Mike Lane and his good wife and one of the elders and I think uh, one of the elders' wives to come and do a presentation to us on the update is what's going on at Hackleburg. You remember back in May, we uh, amassed quite a large fund that we were able to provide for them and they're looking forward to coming and presenting to us how they have uh, been able to start their recovery process and give us some details concerning that but that will be at 7 p.m. our evening service will be at 7 p.m. Sunday the 25th. There's a gospel meeting that begins uh, next Sunday the 11th through the 15th at Villa Rica where the Larry Acuff will conduct that meeting. Also the next area-wide youth devo will be at the Villa Rica congregation, their evening worship service is at 6, and the Youth Devo will be right there after at the Villa Rica congregation, area-wide Youth Devo next Sunday evening. There's a Ladies' Day at the West Georgia congregation, September the 17th, which is a Saturday. There's some details on the bulletin board here in the hallway. Lord's Supper is kept prepared for those that wish to observe it. Once we stand to sing, go through this door, second door on the left, and there will be someone there waiting to serve you. Our next service, Wednesday at 7. Should we mention anything else? Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the opportunity that we've had to come here today. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the lessons that were taught here today. We pray that we'll take them and use them in our lives so that we'll be better Christians for you. Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll be with those traveling, that they will return to us safely. And dear Lord, we ask that you be with those that are bereaved right now and those that are sick. In Christ's name, amen.